Hi everyone, so this is the first video on developmental psychology. And this is literally the study from womb to tomb. So we're looking at different strands of development, how we change physically, socially, cognitively, and morally over our lifetimes. So it's very important through this unit that you keep in mind one of the great debates of psychology, one of the major themes in this course, which is nature versus nurture. So are you who you are because of the way you were born? That would be the nature argument. So your behaviors, your thoughts, your traits come from your genetics, or are you the way you are because of the way you were raised? That's the nurture argument. So the idea that our behaviors come from our environment and we learn from our surroundings. If we look at our central tendency, most people like to believe that nurture is the more important factor in our development. We like to believe that if we try hard enough we can do anything we want to do. That's a nurture idea. But nature does put some serious restrictions on our development. Genetics can give us certain limitations and no matter how much you alter your environment you can't break through that nature barrier. And of course, as we've talked about through this entire course, the true answer lies in the combination of both nature and nurture. Now thinking back to the very first unit of AP Psych, when we talked about research methods, you might ask the question, well, how do you know anyway? How do you design research or an, an experiment that you can actually differentiate between the two? And twins really are the best way to study this issue of nature versus nurture. And I mentioned this in class today, um, but just one thing to keep in mind is the best way to study nature versus nurture is when there is a set of identical twins. Um, and remember, identical twins are two people with almost exactly the same genetic makeup. Um, and these twins are raised separately, so they were separated at birth. There are not a lot of these individuals, but there has been extensive research on these individuals, so you can um, distinguish between what is nature and what is nurture. Now two research methods that you do need to be familiar with are cross-sectional studies um, and this is where the study takes place at the very same time and you have uh, different groups of ages that are studied and then there's longitudinal studies so that's one group of people and they're studied over a period of time. This is a really good time to stop and look at the yellow packet I gave you today. There's some really nice, it's a really nice diagram that helps you to distinguish between the two. Now most of the research is cross-sectional studies. Longitudinal studies are very difficult to do just because it takes so long. Um, but there's advantages and disadvantages to each. So now to the different sections or types of development and just so you know probably from the handout and and from the Barron's reading that I passed out you figure this out we've got four sections or types of development. We're looking at physical development, social development, cognitive development, and moral development. So this first chunk today is all about physical development. So this is all the physical stuff. This is health class. How did our physical body change over time? Yeah, these pictures are weird. So let's start with prenatal development, the very beginning. Conception begins with the drop of an egg and the release of about 200 million sperm. So your definition of zygote here is the first cells of conception. So the first two weeks of conception, less than half of all zygotes survive. And after about 10 days, the zygote itself will attach to the uterine wall. And the outer part of the zygote becomes the placenta, which ends up filtering the nutrients through this prenatal development. As a zygote, your cells begin to rapidly divide and your heart begins to beat. Then after about two weeks, the, the zygote develops into an embryo. And this lasts about six weeks. Um, this is where the heart's beating and the organs are beginning to develop. This is a good time now to look at that yellow handout called prenatal development. 
by nine weeks, we have a fetus. Um, and by about the sixth month, if you think about development, the stomach is developed, other organs have formed enough to, sur to survive outside of the mother. And if you think about this in terms of weeks, and by the way, um, generally speaking, when you calculate the development of uh, the prenatal development is by weeks, not by months. And actually, this whole thing is 38 weeks. Generally speaking, by 24 weeks, the fetus is developed. Uh, all major organs have been developed. And in terms of the health of a pregnancy, 28 weeks is the big, um, the key number. After that period, generally, if a child, if that um, child is born, the child generally is, has a really, really good chance of survival. 24 to 28 weeks is kind of that gray range. So maybe everything's developed, but that child might have some complications um, early in their life that might be permanent. Now this stuff is positively fascinating and I could I could talk more in length about it but we're going to kind of move on to complications um, and teratogens are these chemical agents that can harm the prenatal environment. So there's an example of a fetal alcohol child, a child with fetal alcohol ch uh, syndrome and just some key characteristics. You notice the lips um, are slightly different and the shape of the head is, is slightly abnormal. No. Um, then some STDs can harm the baby, HIV, um, herpes, uh, that's awful, that's awful, go away, okay, uh, and sometimes a child could be born, um, these are children born with herpes, um, okay, enough, uh, and genital warts would be another one. Um, so childbirth, I'm not going to play this video for you. It's actually kind of graphic. But if you want to watch it, um, just go on to Moodle, pull up the PowerPoint, and click on this. Um, I remember when I was um, pregnant for the first time, we had to take these classes, and we had to watch one of these videos. And you've probably seen it in health class. I just remember one of the husbands um, passed out just watching the video, and I felt really bad. Um, and then I felt bad for the woman because he had to be with her during the actual birth, and, you know, that's kind of tough. So some of us think this is a little bit uh, graphic or maybe even disgusting. Some people find it beautiful. If you want to watch it, there it is um, on Moodle. I'm not going to show it to you now. Um, so healthy newborns right away turn their heads towards voices and some research says that they're able to distinguish um, the sounds of their mothers and fathers um, from other voices and they are legally blind. They can see 8 to 12 inches from their faces and if you think about like um, development and evolution, um, they're able to see their mother's face when they're eating um, and they gaze longer at human-like objects right away from birth and that's Big Tony, by the way, my uh, youngest guy. Um, reflexes are pretty fascinating. So when we think about that nurture-nurture argument, these um, are reflexes. These are things that a child is born with right away. Inborn automatic responses. So rooting, rooting is um, if you put your finger over here on the side of the child's mouth, um, they will start to kind of, they'll turn their lips that way and they'll start to suck um, because they want to eat. And sucking is... Um, pretty basic. They're born with the ability to suck. In fact, if a child, if an infant doesn't have that ability, um, there's a lot of concern. That child might have some very, very severe problems. Um, the moral reflex is, this is an image of it, and this is the reflex for falling. So um, if startled, the infant will throw up their hands, their arms, and their legs in the air. Um, it's that startling reflex, and they feel it, it, it really is a reflex because in the womb they were all tight together, secure, and now exposed to air with their arms and legs just kind of hanging out there. Uh, they often just feel like they're falling, like they're not stable. Grasping is another reflex, which is kind of cute because some new parents think, oh, they love me, they're holding my hand. Um, but that's just a reflex, it's just what we're born with. And then there's the babing, the babing. Blah, the Babinski reflex, and that's if you stroke their little foot, their foot will kind of curl. Um, each of these items has a little video on YouTube. I think I'll actually just show you these tomorrow in class so you don't have to pull those up. 
And all of these reflexes um, go away except for, well, the blinking one I didn't talk about. So what you want to do um, in your packet, there's a sheet on the infant reflexes, and it's really, really interesting. Um, some of them, and, and from an evolutionary psychology point of view and the developmental psychology point of view, you could argue that it makes sense to have these reflexes in the beginning and as the child grows and develops and begins to move and become more independent, then those reflexes disappear. And um, one vocabulary word here is maturation. So a baby's physical development, our development as well, it happens regardless of the environment around you. You can't actually stop um, things from happening. It's just how we're made. Everybody can develop at kind of a different pace, um, but generally there is a window and the sequence is always the same. So here's pu puberty. Um, again, if you want, you can click on this weird uh, video. And primary sexual characteristics. So the, during puberty, the body structures um, that make reproduction possible begin to develop. And if you um, printed off the PowerPoint in class, you might have had some pictures on there. I decided to get rid of them because they're a little bit weird. Um, then there's secondary sexual characteristics that develop. So females, widening of the hips, males, deeper voice, um, males, hair, body, hair, and females, breast development. Um, then we have landmarks for puberty and adulthood. <laughs> and some would say after adulthood it all goes downhill. Physical milestones of adulthood. Um, this is kind of weird, um, but maybe humorous to some people going through menopause. And let's talk about life expectancy. Um, that is one thing that continues to increase. It's about 75 now. Females outlive men by about four years today. So more men are actually conceived, quite a bit more than women, but um, oh, yeah. men die easier according really? to these, yeah, these okay. numbers. Yeah, the, the, the and then we have death. Um, a name to remember is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and she came up with these stages of death and grief. Um, you're probably somewhat familiar with these. Oops. Um, you've probably heard of these before. And one thing about this, um, she did come up with these stages, but they're not necessarily in order. They're not necessarily progressive, and you don't necessarily go through every stage. Um, so, you know, it, it's there. It's there as a talking point. It's there as a, a, maybe something to consider as you move through those stages of grief. Um, but it's it's variable. It depends on the situation and depends on the relationship and everybody deals different, differently. Now I'm going to stop this video here um, for today. So this is what you need to know. But I really just kind of flew through this stuff. So make sure that you read your packet. Make sure you go through um, all the stages of motor development. Make, make sure you go through what's in um, both the AP Barron's prep guide packet and the yellow packet that I gave you in class today. Um, and we'll have a very short quiz tomorrow um, just to see kind of what you got and then we'll kind of move forward to the next stage.